Good afternoon, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer. Hope you're all doing very well today, and it is time for another theory video. This theory video is which flavor of BGX and Modern is right for you. So this is brought to us by a wonderful of the veil tier of the veil tier, it's a bit of a mouthful, Patreon supporter named Nick. And Nick qualified for a donation league, but as the post in the description below says, if you want to check that out. You don't have to use it for a league, so if you qualify for a donation league, most people will have me play a list of their choice through a league, and Nick was down for that too. But I'm very, very happy to do a theory video for you instead, so if you want to get into a big picture kind of philosophical categorical take on a broad archetype like this video is doing, or if you want me to do a deep dive on a specific card or a specific maybe pairing of cards, anything and everything in between that you would like me to cover, I am very happy to bring the supporters exactly what they want. So that's what we're up to here. And at the behest of Nick, we are talking about the pros and cons of Rock, Jund, and Absin. Uh, Nick is not so much into Sultai, and Sultai is also kind of overall, you know, across, again, the broad history and perhaps the future of modern. You know, we're talking long-term, big-picture stuff here. Sultai is kind of the odd man out. I will touch on it a little bit, but it will not be focused on as keenly as the aforementioned three. But anyway, my friends, we are going to talk about the pros and cons of each flavor of BGX starting right now. And uh, yeah, once again, thank you so much to Nick, and thank you as always to all Patreon supporters. Now, without further ado, let's get into some theory. All right, guys, so we got to start out with the kind of the simplest and in many ways the most appealing to me. Still, after all of these years, it's got to be my favorite deck in all of Magic across any format, BG the Rock, Golgari Midrange. Like, there's just nothing like it to me. This is what started me um, off on the channel. It's all that I used to do. And of course, these days I do a much wider variety of, of gameplay for you. But good old rock, I can never stray too far from my home. And this right here, my friends, is my home. So I want this video to be kind of timeless in that it's not going to be so dependent on exactly what the meta is right now at the time of recording. Again, we are talking long term, big picture truisms that apply to these various sub archetypes of green black x and modern so why would you play rock over alternatives if you're here if you're asking yourself this question we already assume that you want to play a bgx deck of some kind you want to leverage uh really powerful disruption like Thought Seize, Fatal Push, Liliana of the Veil. You want to punch a hole in your opponent's game plan, and you want to exploit it with very high card quality in the form of cards like Tarmogoyf and recurring advantage in the form of cards like Dark Confidant or Tireless Tracker. So that's what the BGX archetype is up to, of course. But what flavors do things better and what flavors do things worse? So starting off here with the Rock, as always, my friends, I've said it before, I'll say it again, the number one attraction to keeping it two colors, to keeping it clean, is the mana base. So the mana base of a two-color deck as opposed to a three-color deck does several very important things for us. Number one, it affords us as much consistency as you want. Now, in practice, many times a two-color deck will not be appreciably or at all more consistent at, for example, producing two black sources by turn three to cast Liliana than three-color decks would be. But if your metagame or if your preferences or if your specific build calls for it, the two-color deck can be more consistent than the three-color decks at, at producing specific colors. But even when that's not the case, it is definitely always going to be less painful than the three-color mana bases. It is also going to be more utility-rich. Even though you won't have access to certain good utility lands, um, you will have a higher density of utility lands, and you can also realistically field things like Field of Ruin that other three-color decks simply cannot afford to field. Finally, we have a high, high density of basic lands. Again, kind of the sky is the limit, realistically speaking. If you want to make the accommodations for it, you can see I have five basics here. You can play six. You could even stretch it to play seven if you have the fear 
of Path to Exile, Settle the Wreckage, Assassin's Trophy, Field of Ruin, so on and so forth, really taxing your basic lands. So this does a whole lot for us, and in turn, this land base with, again, the painlessness, the utility richness of it, the consistency, and the high density of basic lands, these... Um, these lands, these land slots in a 60 card deck are the building blocks of the deck as a whole, and therefore the advantages there cascade into advantages elsewhere that we can leverage our spells with more effectively. So just to give you some examples here, and again, don't get t too caught up in the exact specifics of this list at this time in the meta. This is, is a recent list that I've played on the channel. It is a recent stock rock list I've taken through a league and, and done well with, but these, again, are kind of timeless lessons. They're kind of timeless truisms that will have existed for years in modern and will exist for years, pending wizards continuing to blow up the format with radical new printing. So Fuel of Ruin, this is, again, the number one land in terms of utility base that Rock can leverage, while three-color BGX decks cannot. And the reasons for this being a very, very powerful tool should be self-explanatory to anybody with a modicum of modern experience of course, attacking opponent manlands, uh, breaking up Tron, breaking up the, um, or rather attacking the Karoo lands and Amulet Titan, the list goes on. Field of Ruin is a very powerful card. It can force a shuffle, which is relevant in a lot of matchups against a scrying opponent. It can generate revolt for our fatal pushes. It can fix our own mana, you know, basically tutoring up in a really clunky way, but in a viable way, nevertheless, an extra green source for our scavenging ooze or perhaps a second black source that we may otherwise be lacking. So Field of Ruin is definitely an all-star and kind of emblematic of what I just mentioned in terms of Rock's mana base being a strength in and of itself, a strength in a vacuum, and also an indirect strength in that it leverage it allows us to leverage other things better. Like I just mentioned, Fatal Push and Scavenging Ooze both do get better in some ways via the presence of Field of Ruin. Castle Lock Thwain is another great example here because the painlessness of Rock's mana base is what allows us to leverage this card to its maximum potential. The f uh, between the pain of the three color decks and the fact that they can ill afford lands that produce only one color, uh, aside from kind of the basic must-haves like a few basic lands and so on and so forth, maybe a Baron Morin Jund that you don't usually intend to use as a land drop anyway, Castle Lock Thwain is a much cleaner fit in the rock, and this is a card that can really help us keep up with the grinding decks, you know, the three color decks do have more grinding power, whether they be, uh, you know, our BGX cousins or, you know, a three or four color snow pile is, is what's in vogue these days. Castle Lock Thwain. Castle Lock Thwain can single handedly keep us up if you're in top deck mode with grindy decks. So Nurturing Peatland is another great example. Um, this is a it's a very low opportunity cost to include this because it comes in untapped. It produces both of the colors that we need, and it serves as flood insurance, and, you know, it can also enable revolt, so on and so forth. This is just a great land that, once again, fits much more cleanly into rock than it does in any other BGX deck, with the possible partial exception of Jund. Uh, Jund, of course, being able to loop Nurturing Peatland with Renin 6 is a different upside, but in terms of how it just fits without specifically comboing with one card, yeah, Nurturing Peatland and the Rock, it doesn't get cleaner than this. Um, Hissing Quagmire is an example of kind of a subpar slot, but one that is still available to you. Uh, if you could play Shambling Vent or... Um, Raging Ravine, for example, in these colors? Yeah, you probably would. But Hissing Quagmire is not strictly worse than either, and even though it is a little bit lower in raw power, it is still filling a very important function in the deck in that it's a land drop that becomes a mana sink or a pseudo spell in the late game. And finally, Treetop Village is a little bit more of an impactful example because it's a little bit more of an impactful card. And much like Castle Lock Thwain, it is a one-color 
land that sometimes enters tapped and or has other downsides and the three color decks can ill afford this but because we only require two colors on the rock treetop village goes a long long way so those are all of the examples in this list you can see how each in their own way feeds into the example that i gave or the argument that i made rather at the beginning the land base is the strength of rock and it's a strength in a vacuum, and it also has cascading strengths that, in terms of enabling the spells, are very, very important. Let's talk a little bit about those. Okay, guys, so the two most important examples of what I just said are right here next to each other. It is Dark Confidant and Scavenging Ooze. So we on the rock can leverage Dark Confidant better than the three color deck simply by virtue, once again, of our painless mana base relative to those. So taking a few hits off of Bob is not as big of a deal if you haven't taken a few hits off of your land base. In a deck like Jund, in a deck like Absin, in a deck like Sultai, you are almost guaranteed to have to fetch and shock or even even just shock straight, uh, straight out of your hand at some point in any given matchup that is far less common in the rock and therefore we have a little bit more leeway with Bob's quest for greatness hopefully not coming at too high a cost sometimes the painless nature of the rock mana base is all that spares you from an ignominious death at the hands of your own Bob and that's a very very powerful thing so again the painless mana allows us to leverage Bob better in terms of just giving him free reign and walking the tightrope that sometimes we need to walk to get a win. Scavenging Ooze is even more impactful as an example, if you ask me. So um, while the life gain is always nice in matchups where your life total matters, often, for example, with Jund, you will be fetching and shocking to play your spells along the curve and to curve out, and then you are hoping to stick your scoos and activate it a few times and all you will have achieved is kind of treading water with the card in reference to your life total. And don't get me wrong, that's very good. It's good to make up lost ground in this way when your life total does matter. But on the rock, very often, your mana, once again, it's a lot more painless. And more importantly, perhaps, the green is often more flush. It, you, you are just more flush in general of green sources. You have a higher green source count. A lot of the decks... A lot of the three color decks end up on something like 15 green sources, which is more than sufficient to cast your Tarmogoyfs consistently on curve. And indeed to cast your Scoos on curve, but often you'll be operating off maybe one or two green sources, whereas on a lot of rock decks, on a lot of rock progressions, you'll have just about as many green sources as you will lands in play. Now this is not a guarantee or anything, but the point here is that Scoos is both a deadlier tool and one that actually has higher upside in this deck. Um, I feel, for example, pretty well able to compete with Dredge in game one if I go discard into Scoos, especially on the play on Rock. Now, you don't always get there. You don't usually beat their nut draws that have like multiple enablers and payoffs in hand and they have good hits off of their early dredges, yes, you're still probably not going to get there. But if you have the opponent on like a disruptable progression, when I'm on the rock going discard into Scoos, I'm actually feeling pretty good. I'm actually feeling that if, you know, I can continue making land drops and I can continue just sequencing very carefully, I'm probably going to get there. Whereas on Jund and on Abs and in the past, I've just had too many progressions where I don't have enough green sources to leverage Scoos. It's a little bit too painful as well. And despite being able to stick my main deck Grave Hate on curve game one, it's still not quite enough. Um, obviously, we've all been in situations against aggro decks, whether it be burn, prowess, humans, anything like this, where you are on the knife's edge. You end up winning with one or two life left in the tank on the back of a huge scavenging ooze who came down, who stabilized the board, who eventually turned sideways to win after he held off attacks for a few turns. And of course, when you're on the rock, that one or two life is something you would not have had to spare on a three-color deck, all else being equal. So there you go, guys. Those are a couple of the most important examples. Um, I guess I'm seeing scav uh, Kitchen Finks, rather, excuse me, in the sideboard as another card that makes a lot more sense to me in rock than it does in 
for in Jundersultai, Sultai, maybe on Absin, the white can help you cast this too. But really, Kitchen Finks is just a much more realistic card to cast on curve without, again, having to maybe fetch and shock as often, so the life gain is just treading you water. When Kitchen Finks is well positioned, I think it slots more cleanly into rock, especially because all of the things that I've just mentioned, a big, big attraction to playing the rock is when burn is good. And also when Prowess is good, but especially when Burn is good, Rock is a deck that lines up so, so well against it. You can still have all of your BGX um, pros and cons across the meta. You know, you're you're good at disrupting combo decks. You're a little soft to big mana decks unless you're really well prepared for them. So on and so forth. You know, you're good against small creatures. You, you're not as good against the blue decks. But Rock lines up naturally so, so well against Burn. If you even respect them a little bit, your matchup is favorable, if you ask me. Whereas on Jund, it's just really never that favorable. Even if you're packing three collective brutality in the side, eh, it still always feels so dicey. And all of the things that I've mentioned here are reasons why. So that is my case for Rock. That's kind of what you can expect signing up for uh for a league or for long-term play with the Rock. Those are the pros, but what are the cons? Let's talk a little bit about that. So the downside of the rock, my friends, is obvious. You do not have access to the third color, so your card pool is restricted. And how does that manifest? Like, that's an obvious point to make, but how does that actually manifest in practice? Well, as you can see from my list here, we've got a lot of cards that see play in other BGX archetypes. A lot of the core black interactive cards, Tarmogoyf, um, the green black removal, these are all mainstays no matter what BGX flavor you're on. But... Questing Beast, not really a card that you'll almost ever reach for if you could play Bloodbraid Elf instead. Tireless Tracker, rarely a card that you'll reach for if you have other options like um, Stoneforge Mystic and Lingering Souls and Absin, that's like Snapcaster Mage and Uro in Sultai, or of course Bloodbraid Elf, Seasoned Pyromancer, so on and so forth in Jund. These are just kind of best in class for the express purpose that I've included them here in our colors, but it is hard to argue that most of the time, under most circumstances with most expected metagames, having access to the third color is going to give you a better threat suite, whatever your purpose is. You know, sometimes you will play a, a tireless tracker in Jund. It pairs really well with Renin 6. Sometimes you play a questing beast in Absin for a nice hasty curve topper that does all the great things QB does. But overall, you will be missing out on something, no matter what you're trying to do when you're restricted only to two colors. And that also applies to the lands. I mentioned all of the strengths of the land base, but one of the weaknesses, no Raging Ravine or no Shambling Vent. So our dual colored creature land is a little bit subpar compared to theirs, for example. And then you have other things like Renin 6 literally just puts Jund back on the map. Any, any BGX deck not playing Renin 6 is losing out in that way. It's just a really strong card. And then, increasingly, this matters for hate cards, too. It didn't used to matter that much, or I at least felt that it didn't used to matter that much when I first started off on Rock. But these days, if you look at the sideboard, we've got a lot to like. But Veil of Summer... Veil of Summer is really cramping our style. Veil of Summer makes Fulminator Mage a whole lot worse than he used to be, especially when you could theoretically be playing Pillage or even Stone Rain with Jund. Another great example of this is Choke. I think Choke is very well positioned. I think Choke is nearly mandatory, especially for a BG the Rock deck that wants to compete with blue snow piles, but it is hard to argue that Boil isn't better. I think, obviously, Choke has some other good things going for it. You know, if they deal with it, it's an enchantment that grows the goif. Of course, coming down a turn earlier is really nice, but I think overall, in a vacuum, I rate Boil more highly. And of course, we cannot play Boil when we're not playing Red. And if you look at a card like Liliana the Last Hope, she's great. I think she's a very respectable card, but you don't usually see, for example, a Jun player registering her because a lot of their three color or their three mana options, when you incorporate the Red into the fold, have just kind 
of squeezed her out a little bit. Between that and between Ren and Six being a good pinger, just like she is, yeah, it's hard to see some of these cards that we want to or indeed have to play in Rock making the cut in the three-color deck. So there you go, guys. Those are kind of the pros and cons of the Rock. Um, in terms of the overall gameplay, the overall feel of the deck, this is going to be more subjective than the things I just laid out for you, but I personally love the rock. I think it's the best entry point because it is the easiest to play. Uh, you just don't have as much to manage. Your fetching decisions are a lot easier. Um, your sequencing in the early turns is a lot easier, and that's really when sequencing tends to matter the most. And it is the most financially justifiable entry point. Obviously, the core rock cards build into any of the three color BGX decks that you would want anyway. You might end up picking up a few cards that you won't use as often if you start with rock and then move eventually to a three color deck. For example, like I mentioned, QB, Tireless Tracker, things like this, but they're still good ones to have in the maybe board. So rock is a great entry point because again, it's a little bit easier to play than the three color decks, which tend to be more complicated, uh, at least have a steeper learning curve, let's say, and it's cheaper. So it's more accessible. And I personally, after again, all of these games, all of these years, I still love the rock. They're there's still something very special about it. The clean two color progression, the symmetry of black and green, and the gold cards kind of tying them together. You know, sometimes I look at the three color decks, no, no offense to my three color boys and girls out there, but they just look ugly to me. They just look ugly. Sometimes they look a little bit haphazard. And sometimes it's useful to try to calibrate for a meta using the rock instead of trying to like scratch your head looking at a recently changed meta and looking at a Jun deck and having a little bit overwhelming uh, sensation sometimes in terms of the amount of options. Maybe you try to calibrate with rock first. The restriction can be clarifying. The restriction can be liberating, ironically enough. And you figure out what you would do if you only had the rock to play, and maybe that helps you brew or tweak your Jund or Absin deck a little bit better. So there you go, guys. That's my take on Rock. As always, as always, I want to hear what you think, so let me know what you think in the description below. But let's move on next to Jund. All right, on to Jun, my friends. And I don't remember if I addressed this at the beginning of the video, but again, I want this to be kind of a timeless reference point, one that exceeds the limitations and the focuses of this exact moment. So there are no companions in the list I'm showing you because I think companion, specifically Luris, is going to be short-lived in modern overall. I want this to be uh, kind of a window into the past, past and also hopefully a window into the future. So a lot of what I'm saying also applies to the companion builds as well. But we're talking more broadly, we're talking more generally, and now we're talking about Jund. So what you're looking at is a list, obviously, from the pre-companion meta, one that I played uh, to a decent result through League and was brewed up by the fine folks on my Discord. And the reason I picked this one is because it's got a little bit of everything. It's kind of a very teched out, very spicy list with a lot of one of some unusual choices, especially in the main deck, and that's just kind of giving you the full spectrum of what a modern Jun deck can look like. So as with Rock, let's talk about the pros and cons. So a major, major con to Jund relative to Rock is that mana base. It just feels awful, especially if you're like me, you played a ton of Rock to start out and only much later got into Jund. You're like, this mana is a disaster. It's a disaster. It had a steep learning curve for me and, and for many others. Um, but more importantly, even if you're using it with maximum proficiency, it is just a bad mana base compared to the clean and painless and utility rich mana base of the rock. But it is not strictly worse because you actually have a lot of really high upsides on the utility lands that Jund does bring to bear. So Raging Ravine is just an extraordinarily powerful mid-range finisher. Classic Jund Situation is you trade one for one and two for one, and maybe your opponent trades back two for one in some cases. And when the dust settles, you're both in top deck mode. So, of course, any BGX deck hopes to be able to top deck, uh, out top deck the opponent. And in many cases, we will. It's not as true that we will almost always do so like it used to be, but it's still true in many cases that we will. But Sometimes you don't even really need to out top deck the opponent. You just need to top deck about as well as the opponent because you happen to have a raging ravine on the field and this thing 
closes the game in a real hurry once it is uncontested and once all of the resources on either side have been exhausted. So Raging Ravine is a much more impressive finisher than any other BGX deck can boast. Um, and that's definitely a huge incentive to playing the deck. Nurturing Peatland is not as clean of a fit in Jund as it is in Iraq because we can ill afford the pain. And it also only produces two of the three colors that we need, but in one very important way, it has a huge upside. You can buy it back and loop it infinitely with Renin 6, getting a free draw. Every turn is very, very powerful when you are in a grinding situation, and Baron Moor is kind of the same idea. Of course, a much worse land, even the Nurturing Peat land, to play and use for mana production, but a much more efficient cycler than the aforementioned Peat land. So, Definitely, we're seeing Renin 6 here. Renin 6 is the glue of Jund. Like I said earlier, it did put Jund back on the map, and it's even making Jund's mana base <laughs> um, an asset again, which is no mean feat. So Renin 6, this card, is mid-range distilled into one card. I am still, if you really look at this card, and if you really consider the egregious, radical, over-the-top power creep that we've had in the latter half of 2019 spilling over into 2020, even in the context of all of that, it's still kind of shocking that they printed such a pushed two-mana Planeswalker, if you ask me, but pushed uh, she is. And Renin 6 just does, again, everything you want. It has, in fact, largely, not fully, but largely displaced former Jund staple Dark Confidant, and I think that corroborates what I said earlier about how Bob is much more easily leveraged in the rock than it is in Jund, because the, the painful mana of Jund makes Bob a liability. Renin 6 is just drawing you those lands, and while the land is not necessarily as exciting off of the Bob as the Bob hits, and, and is definitely sometimes not what you need, most of the time with Bob, you're kind of hoping to flip lands anyway, especially in the early turn. So Renin 6, being able to control the board against X1s, this card is just nuts. It is even a win condition. And Renin 6 single-handedly put Jun back on the map, like I said. But that's not all. Bloodbraid Elf is a very, very big incentive to play Jund because it is a two-for-one and it's very proactive. In many ways, Bloodbraid Elf, even more than Renin 6, to me, epitomizes Jund's role in the BGX family. Jund is a little bit higher variance than the other ones to me, sometimes. Not least because Bloodbraid Elf herself is a very high variance card. If you are in any kind of an attrition matchup and you're able to cast her on curve into like a Liliana of the Veil vale or any of these other hyper impactful three drops, Coligan's Command, when both modes are, when any two of the modes are are alive, this epitomizes Jun's ruthlessness. Not only are you curving out and crushing them with maximum efficiency, you are also not wasting any time. You are ending the game in an absolute hurry, relative to other BGX decks anyway. We're still on the slower side of modern clocks, but Jund has a very rapid clock by mid-range standards, and all of these cards that you're looking at here kind of follow that lead of Bloodbraid Elf. Bloodbraid Elf, again, kind of epitomizing that mentality, because as good as she can be, sometimes she can also cascade into a fatal push on an empty board, and then you just cast a Volshock Berserkers as your top end in modern. Not where you want to be, but look at every red card, basically. Lightning Bolt. Lightning Bolt is kind of strangely a high variance card, just in the sense that we're usually using it as an answer, and rarely will our answers like Assassin's Trophy not line up against something, but Lightning Bolt can very often, relative to those, not line up against what you need it to line up against. However, it can always go upstairs. It's a good proactive card. It's very, very strong. I'm not counter-signaling the card. I'm just saying it's a little bit anomalous in uh, so far as the normal green-black X pantheon of interaction goes, but it contributes also to that ruthlessness because it gives you a much higher density of good turn one removal than any other deck has access to. You don't want to path anything on turn one, and Rock and Sultai don't really have access to playable main deck one mana removal aside from Fatal Push. So, Lightning Bolt, ruthless. 
ruthless at, per at keeping the early progressions contained from your opponent, and also ruthless at closing out the game. Um, this also applies to Kroxa Titan of Death's Hunger. So Kroxa can be extremely oppressive when you are layering discard, when you are going discard into Kroxa, into Liliana of the Veil. That is just more discard than almost any deck can handle and still function anywhere near the way they want to be functioning. And of course, Kroxa is no mere attrition card, no mere hand disruptor, because unlike Liliana, who's plus one, can sometimes be a mixed blessing at best, or can actively be a liability, or unlike Inquisition or Thoughtseize, which sometimes can be just the worst possible top deck in your entire library, Kroxa. Kroxa is always going to be a lava spike, even if the opponent's hellbent and, of course, can later be escaped to be a finisher par excellence. If we thought Bloodbraid Elf turned the corner quickly, think about how quickly Kroxa, or if we thought Raging Ravine could close out the board when it's empty really quickly, think about how quickly Kroxa does, you know. It's going to hit them for three when you cast it. It's going to hit them for another three when you escape it. A lot of the time, those will be true. And then it's going to hit them for nine on an uncontested board. Attack for six. Lava Spike you again for three. The card is just nutty, and in that way, it is further buttressing the position of Jund as the more ruthless deck of the four of the BGX family. Um, so Renin 6 can also be ruthless when you're against X1s, and it's also ruthless in a much slower way because it's got such inevitability in the grind with the plus one, especially when paired with, an, with a Liliana on your side or indeed against an opposing Liliana. So that kind of covers the main... Um, broad strokes of Jund, the pros and the cons, we have higher variance and higher pain in terms of what our spells do and what we have to do to cast them on curve. But Jund crushes people when it's curving out and when its spells are lining up like no other BGX deck can. We are crushing them, we are giving them no room to breathe, and we are giving them no time to recover because we close the game out so quickly. And that's kind of how the core of Jund operates, but what about the red splash cards or the flex slots or the hate board? The hate board, yeah, the sideboard hate, things like that. I'm going to start calling my sideboard the hate board. That's actually pretty epic, but um, what, do the, what do the red cards do in that slot? Well, like I kind of touched on when I was talking about rock, I feel like the relevance of red as a color in those flex slots or in those hate board slots actually has just been steadily increasing over like the past year and a half or so. Season Pyromancer in this main deck is a great example. Bloodbraid Elf is obviously very, very good, but again, a little high variance when it comes to grinding. Season Pyromancer is kind of the opposite of high variance because Spyro cashes in your otherwise high variance cards, whether it be, you know, sometimes you'll have an uncastable Bloodbraid Elf in hand. Sometimes you'll have Dead Discard in hand. Sometimes you will have things that you just feel could be exchanged for better cards, or sometimes you will have excess lands, no matter, or sometimes you will be hellbent. No matter what your situation, in all of those situations, in all of those different ways, variants can have either got you there, or variants can be your downfall from that point on. But Season Pyromancer is just going to say, nope, we're going to keep churning through the deck and we're going to get some value along the way by making elementals upon ETB, and then we are going to have even more value out of the graveyard later on if the opponent is forced to deal with the Pyromancer in some way. So this is a great example of a card that you can opt for in Jund if you want to make it grindier for a certain metagame, or maybe, and or I should say, if you want to play other spicy cards that may or may not be ideal in the main deck situation. In other words, the spicier you get and the higher variance your choices become, the more incentive you have to play a card like Pyro so you can at least loot them away if the game's going long and you'd rather see you know, more core cards or more proactive cards, whatever the case may be. But we were spicing in an Ashiok here main deck. And one of the strengths and weaknesses of Jun that is 
epitomized by Ashiok being a little bit main deckable, at least in a primeval Titan meta, is its graveyard dependency. So uh, note that Rock, the list I showed you, is not that graveyard dependent. Yes, your Goyfs will be a 0-1 against Rest in Peace, and yes, Scooz gets a lot worse without anything to eat. But with Rock, you're still disrupting. You've got an, a ton of green-black cards that can remove the rest in peace, you can discard it before it hits the board, and you are still using Dark Confidant, Tireless Tracker, Questing Beast, and maybe some other things I forgot about that, one of Hexdrinker, I should, I should add, to kind of be so-called above-ground threats. Jund is increasingly graveyard dependent. That's an important thing to note, and you can build it in such a way where it's not as graveyard dependent, but realistically, an optimized Jun deck for any foreseeable meta should be more graveyard dependent and should be deriving more value from the graveyard than an optimized rock deck. If you look at Renin 6 and Kroxa, these are cards that are far too powerful to leave out. They are both, in some ways, graveyard dependent. Now, you can still get value out of them, even if the graveyards are totally shut off. They're never totally dead, but they're not at their best when that's the case. Um, another example of this is Clothis. Clothis, again, this was a meta call. It's very main deckable, and this, of course, is a red card and therefore is something that no other BGX deck can play. And anyone who has been on the receiving end of a Clothis out of, for example, a Gruel Monsters deck knows full well how inevitable this card is in a grind. It's going to do a lot of things. It's actually kind of similar to Renin 6 in a weird way, in that it can ramp you, it can also get you value, and if your opponent doesn't have a way to deal with it, it will kind of carry the game away, assuming that both players are trying to play a fair game, take the game long, etc. So Clothis is a great example of a card that didn't exist a year ago, but now is just that extra incentive to play Jund. Your card pool for the red flex slots is just growing and growing and growing. I don't really see it stopping anytime soon, personally. They are showing an increasing willingness to give red, like, pseudo advantage um, that, or, you know, pseudo card draw or advantage in other ways, I should say, that they kind of shied away from in the past. And that seems to be the new norm. But moving on to the sideboard, I mentioned this when we talked about Choke and Rock. Uh, Pillage is far better than Fulminator Mage right now for the express fact that it does not get blown out by Veil of Summer. And that's the card that all the big mana decks are packing. When you need to resolve these cards the most, it is against big mana. You can't afford to get it blown out by Veil of Summer. So Pillage and Boil over Choke and Stone Rain, or excuse me, Choke and Fulminator Mage, these are huge upgrades. And it's kind of funny because not that long ago, none of these cards saw play. And the black cards, whether you were on Jund or Rock, were what you would play in that role. But Veil of Summer, disgusting card, threw a wrench in the mix, and now the red cards are at a premium in that role. Finally, we have other examples here in the sideboard of just really value-positive red cards that fit perfectly into the Jund mid-range plan. Coligan's Command is usually a main deck card. Again, this is a particularly spicy list, but K Command is one of the single-handedly biggest incentives, the biggest draws to Jund. Just look at this. This card, much like Renin 6, is kind of mid-range made manifest. You've got a raise dead mode, you've got a discard mode, which, as mentioned, the really, the layering of discard, the overload of discard, is kind of unique to Jund, specifically because Kroxa and Coligan's Command as non-targeted discard effects make your Thought Seizes and your Lilianas that much more impactful. They do scale exponentially, at least up to a point before they reach diminishing returns, but you've got a Raise Dead mode, a Discard mode, a Shatter mode, and a Shock mode. I mean, what more do you want? This card is amazing. It's one of my favorites, and again, usually main deckable. Huntmaster of the Fells. Huntmaster of the Fells is very cool, first of all, and it's, it's very, very strong. It's a good curve topper when your life total matters and when your opponents are playing creatures. If both of those things, or even sometimes even one of them are true, Huntmaster of the Fells does a little bit of everything. It's another very Jundi card, very BGXy card, and honestly, it is one of the cooler things in Jund. So the overall play experience of Jund, it can be a little bit frustrating on the occasions that you, like, lose to your own mana base against Burn, uh, especially, again, if, like me, you come from a rock background where you're like, ooh, doesn't feel like a match I would have dropped on rock, but we definitely dropped it here on Jund. And every now and then you will be, um, the wrong half of the deck problem can be exaggerated in Jund. 
in that, again, your answers don't necessarily line up as well as they could against certain progressions. Like if you're drawing some some damage-based removal like Lightning Bolt, Coligan's Command, maybe you draw a Renin Six and your opponent's just like playing Eldrazi. Yeah, okay, you might wish you were on the rock and you had like a bunch of, you had like trophies. You just had like trophies and pulses and stuff like that in higher quantities, but Again, with Jund, you've got the quick clock and you've got the ruthlessness. If you have never just, like, totally Junded out an Infect player, you owe it to yourself to do that. You're, like, ripping up the hand, you're killing everything that moves, you're operating on maximum efficiency, and when it's time to turn the corner, you turn it rapidly in the Infect player or the other player that you line up well against, whether it be a combo deck, a small creature deck, what have you, they have no chance to recover in these days. A final thing that I'll add here, Jund is favored against like almost any other mid-range deck I can think of simply because the red, the new red cards, Renin 6, Kroxa, if you're on Season Pyromancer, if you're on Clothis God of Destiny, plus the old faithful red cards that are really good two for ones in any fair matchup like Bloodbraid Elf and Coligan's Command, these cards are just really, really hard to keep up with for a lot of opposing fair decks, whether they be black based mid range or indeed blue based control. Jund has probably got one of the best control matchups out of any mid range deck. Abzin has a pretty good one too. They're both way better than Rock, I'll tell you that. And partially it's because of all the two for ones that the three color mana base brings and the fact that your life total, you can play with it. It's a resource. It doesn't matter that much against control decks. Finally, Boil against those blue decks is just an extra kick in the teeth from Jund. It's a lot harder for them to recover from a Boil than it is even from a Choke. So there you go, guys. That's kind of my take on Jund. I really like Jund. Uh, there's something very, very pleasurable about just Junding somebody out. That's a that's an expression for a reason, right? That's a cliche for a reason. Renin 6 is a pleasure to play. It is a thrill to spin the wheel with Bloodbraid Elf, that's really, really fun. And I like the card Lightning Bolt. I like having access to Lightning Bolt. And uh, finally, it is nice to rest easy with Pillages and Boils against the Dryad of the Lucian Grove Primeval Titan decks or against Tron. You just don't have to cross your fingers and say, well, if they have their one mana cryptic command, I lose. And if they don't, I have a chance. Veil of Summer doesn't do anything to a pillage on an Urza's tower, so there you go, guys. That's kind of my take on Jund. As always, let me know what you think. Let's move on to the White Splash with Absin. Okay, my friends, Absin, Absin, Absin. So Absin's really interesting. In some ways, it is at the most extreme end of the whole BGX family in that it feels the slowest and the grindiest a lot of times, but in other ways it's kind of like a meeting point between Rock and Jun. So let me explain. Um, you have the three color mana base with all the pros and cons that I've already mentioned. Obviously the cons are reduced consistency, increased pain, and reduced quantity in a raw count uh, of utility lands, but it's not as extreme as in Jund, and here is why. Number one, you've got Shambling Ven as your utility land of choice, and you can make up for the life lost by connecting with it a time or two, or blocking with it with lifelink, whatever. You have opportunities to make up the lost life. And number two, you can kind of uniquely design the Absin base in a way that you can't really get away with so much in Jund, such that cards like Silent Clearing are where your pain lands come in, and therefore you will have more times where you are activating the Scoos and actively gaining life instead of trade, uh, treading water like we mentioned that you sometimes have to do in Jund. It feels like you can pull ahead with your Scavenging Ooze on life more often. On the other hand, before I forget to mention it, we're playing cards like Path to Exile. We don't have as much destroy removal that puts things into the graveyard on Absin as we do on Rock or on Jun. So in that way, Scoos is a little bit worse. You can see all of the micro pros and the micro cons for a card like that. But, you know, back to the overarching point, we have the ability to stabilize using the lands themselves, which again kind of unwinds some of the damage that we would otherwise expect to take on a three-color deck. And of course, we are playing a Stoneforge Mystic Package, which I think you just should if you're playing abs, and that's one of the biggest attractions to this archetype as a whole. And you can always tutor up Batterskull, and you can always go to town with that in terms of stabilizing with your life total. So in that sense, uh, as well as in the sense of including Shambling Vent, we are not as punished 
for our three color painful mana base on Abzan is we are on Jund. And this is just kind of like a bare bones stock stone blade package with fire and ice and batter skull. If you're playing the fourth mystic especially, but some people would do this otherwise, you can include a third equipment, either main deck or sideboard, and that could be Sword of Light and Shadow, or it could even be Shadow Spear, and these are other ways to stabilize your life total and to unwind some of the damage, and indeed, in short order, pull ahead of any damage you've taken off of your land base. So, in that sense, it is kind of a meeting point between Rock and Jund, kind of a happy medium, some would say. And in other ways, it's also a happy medium. You saw on my rock list, and this is kind of a coincidence. I didn't plan this out. I'm just looking at like three recent stock lists that I played in the pre-companion meta on this channel. But instead of the zero bob on Jund or the four bob on Rock, we've got the happy medium on Abs, and we've got two. He is a better inclusion than here than he is in Jund, again, because we have more stability in our life total, but we also don't have the Renin Six that might outcompete him in this slot, at least to some degree. And the same is true for Tireless Tracker. Tireless Tracker, we had two in the Rock deck, we had none in the Jund deck, and we've got one here in Abzan. So I hope that illustrates the point that in some ways Abzan is kind of that meeting place between Rock and Jund. But like I said at the beginning of this segment, in an important way, it is an outlier. It is the furthest end of the grindy spectrum because it is slower. And that is where the white cards come into play. Let's talk specifically about the white spells you'll be main decking in Abzan. So we talked about how clean the rock deck can be and how streamlined it can be, and we talked about how fast and ruthless the Jun deck can be. With Absin, the word that comes to mind is inevitability. And that is not as exciting of a word as some of the other ones that I've just used, but it's true. Uh, Path to Exile is a great example of this. It's really awkward to draw a Path to Exile in your opening hand when you are a resource denial deck and you just want to kill their turn one play, but you don't have a fatal push. You're not going to path it, so you just kind of have to say, okay, there's your Monodork or there's your Champion of the Parish, most likely. You're not pathing cards like that right away anyway. So um, that also applies to Stoneforge Mystic. Stoneforge Mystic is a great fit in BGX because she's a great win condition. She is a guaranteed two for one almost all the time if she hits the battlefield. You might get unlucky and draw both of your swords, both of your pieces of equipment first, but that almost never happens. And Lingering Souls is pure distilled value. You've got four evasive bodies off of one card. You can even pitch the card to, for example, a Liliana plus one, and you can still get value off of the back end. So all of these white cards are very, very value positive, again, with the exception of Path to Exile, but Path has its own form of value, its own form of inevitability, in that it is much more of a catch-all hard answer than something like Fatal Push or Lightning Bolt can be, because whatever you're targeting with Path, if you can target it, it's gone. It's gone, it's not coming back, right? So that's the appeal, of course, of Path to Exile. You will see occasionally abs and lists play without it. Three push, two path is kind of the accepted split in that you want to see push more often, especially early, but path is still an important tool, an important incentive to playing white. But Reed Duke famously played abs in at a time when nobody was playing BGX at all a couple of years ago at the Pro Tour, and I don't think he played any copies of Path to Exile. I could be co conflating that with a different list I've seen of his, so please do correct me if I'm wrong, but he was on white for Lingering Souls, and I believe for sideboard cards, not so much for Path to Exile, so there is a degree of um, uncertainty with this card. That's not the right word. It is to some degree an optional card, but it is nevertheless a core incentive to playing white. But the common theme of all of these main deck white cards is they excel in the late game, or they get you a two for one right away if you deploy them in the early game. So that applies to Stoneforge Mystic. You're happy to play her on curve if it's an attrition matchup because they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. If they don't, well, you get to flash in a batter skull on turn three. 
and maybe even cast a one mana spell on the same turn, that's pretty good. If they do have to remove her, well, you just two for one them because you drew a card off of the ETB. Path to Exile, though, excels in the late game. Stoneforge Mystic also excels in the late game as a fine way to bring it, uh, you know, to play a single-handed game-ending threat when the dust has settled. And Lingering Souls. Again, it's fine to play on curve if it's an attrition matchup because removal lines up terribly against Lingering Souls, but this is also one of your very best top decks if you've been trading resources in the mid to late game. So that's kind of the... Uh, the ethos of white. You're not going to ruthlessly or at least as ruthlessly oppress the opponent in terms of like killing everything that moves with maximum efficiency like you can on Jund. You're not going to get the percentage points off of being streamlined and painless with your mana with rock. Um, but, but with white, you've got you can kind of rest easy when you're playing abs and like the longer the game goes on, in certain matchups, under certain circumstances, you might be starting to sweat it out a little bit with Rock, a little bit also with Jund, you know, you're just hoping to top deck certain cards. When you play Absin, it feels like you have a higher density of cards that you can hit that will be like, good, this will carry me ahead of the opponent, and then I can capitalize on that position from there. And they are a little bit more stable in the sense of doing so, at least to me. So that's kind of the big appeal to white. Again, these buzzwords, you know, stability, consistency, they're not as exciting, but frankly, that's what you're signing up for with Absin. So it's different strokes for different folks. If you have that desire, if you have the desire for consistency, if you really like the idea of getting value with Lingering Souls, little mini combo with Liliana of the Veil. And if you just want a really coherent, really disruptive, powerful shell for Stoneforge Mystic, Absin is your guy. Absin is your friend. And as you're uh, able to see here, we do not have that many white sideboard cards. We just kind of have one generic value-oriented one in the form of Gideon. And don't get me wrong, Gideon's very, very strong. If you want any kind of a boost in any kind of an attrition matchup, Gideon just lines up well no matter what you're doing in those types of matchups. And even against traditional aggro decks, he's probably better than something you have in your main deck. So not selling the... Uh, the ally of Zendikar short by any stretch of the imagination, my friends. But the truth is, Absin feels so strong in any kind of a, a normal attrition-based meta that you don't really need that many value-oriented sideboard cards. And the other appeal of white that you're not seeing here is that you can main deck those really hard hate cards that white is known for. Now, just like the stock of red hate cards has risen in the past year and a half, the stock of white hate cards has actually fallen, especially in the context of a BGX deck where you don't almost ever want to be packing rest in peace. Like, yes, you can. In a really warped meta, you can. But obviously, we're non-bowing with ourselves a whole lot there between Goyf and Scoos and Lingering Souls and some other stuff. It's just really not what you usually want to reach for. And Previously, Stony Silence was a huge uh, potential inclusion in most BGX, excuse me, most abs in the sideboards, but a variety of factors, including the banning of Mox Opal, the printing of Stone for or the unbanning of Stoneforge Mystic, incentivizing us to play our own artifacts, and the printing of Collector Oof. These are all things that have pushed Stony Silence into the realm of decidedly fringe technology for an abs in deck. Now, that doesn't mean you'll never want to reach for it, but it does mean that in theory, access to white hate sideboard cards has been actually a huge draw to abs in the past. These days, it is pretty low, but you know what? There are all kinds of fringe, really techie calls that can be really, really good. I'm thinking of like Gaddick Teague, for example, here could be an excellent option that gives abs in kind of a, a dimension that's almost mind-blowing, like the hate bear, access to these hate bears in a BGX deck that is able to protect them with discard spells and punch a hole in the opponent's game plan. It's definitely a big attraction to Absin, but right now, at this exact moment, the white hate cards are not that impactful, but they can be in the future, especially because you gotta figure they're gonna show straight up white some love at some point with the new printings, right? So anyway, guys, that's kind of the pros and cons of Absin. In terms of how I feel when I play it. I feel 
I feel less adrenaline and less stress when I play Absin than when I do on Jund. So the thrill factor is not as high. You know, like, resolving a Lingering Souls is not as exciting as <laughs> resolving a Bloodbraid Elf. And you also have a little bit of a feeling like a fish out of water sometimes, specifically with this card, Path to Exile, where you're like, what am I doing with this card in my opener when I'm a resource denial deck? I need to answer early plays efficiently, and I've kind of got this path rotting in hand. But there is a Zen aspect to Absin because sometimes the value just keeps coming and you're winning in like a really fair way where you just bury your opponent in spirit tokens. This card, guys, Lingering Souls, I think is the biggest attraction, even more than Stoneforge Mystic potentially to playing Absin at all. You just trade one for one and then you have a four for one. And yes, they're only one ones, but I'm telling you, they bury the opponent. They are so impactful on so many board states, from empty boards to super crowded boards. Lingering Souls is just a mirror breaker when the opponent cares about grinding too. So there you go. Um, it's pretty cool to connect with Shambling Vent too. And for those who don't know, Absin was actually my entry point to BGX. A lot of you probably assumed that I started with Rock because it is more accessible, but Rock wasn't that much of a thing when I started playing modern seriously. It wasn't seeing that much play. Absin was more common, and Absin is where I started. But eventually, the two-color nature of Rock around the printing of Assassin's Trophy, which gave it that extra tool needed to compete, that's what won me over. But Absin is near and dear to my heart. It's nostalgic for me, and it is powerful again these days with Stoneforge Mystic on board, with the meta so grindy that Lingering Souls is good again, and with Plague Engineer, who's a great tool for us, being a little bit less common these days in the Luris meta. So that's just kind of like, again, a brief window into the moment. Uh, that we're experiencing right now in the meta, but overall, I think those things will stand the test of time, those pros and cons and the experiences with Absin. And finally, guys, we gotta show Sultai just a little bit of love. Not much, not much, even though I love Sultai, because that's not what Nick wanted us to focus on. But we gotta just at least touch on Sultai. I'm showing you a screen cap. I'm screen recording my own YouTube video, which is a little bit awkward, but I no longer own some of these cards that I was borrowing when I made this Earl Gari video, so I just wanted to show you that. Uh, it's easier than reassembling it on MTGO, right? So, Uro. Uro, this guy here, the namesake of Earl Gari, is the big, big incentive to playing Sultai, and I think this is a truer Sultai deck than any other variant of Sultai, but the main attraction to Sultai, besides playing with some powerful cards like Uro and Snapcaster Mage and, and playing a little bit of Permission, Drown in the Lock is pretty sweet as main deckable Permission slash Removal, is the fact that Sultai is a brewer's paradise and has more genuine options. Like, you can go with a blue rock Earl Gari list, just like this one, and that's really, really cool. The blue cards that you play are advancing a traditional BGX game plan, but you can also play a snow sub theme with astrolabes and quattles, and at that point you're playing more for a longer game, so you're trying to play almost like a Sultai control deck uh, with more mid-range elements than a typical control deck, but maybe still more on the control end of the spectrum. And then we've seen some cool Sultai lists on this channel, actually, that some donors have given me over the months. Um, I'm thinking of some like more tempo-oriented lists that play Stubborn Denial, you know, Tarmogoyf, and sometimes even like a big Scooze. Okay, they can turn on Ferocious. Stubborn Denial, Thought Scour, cards like this, playing a little bit more reactively, playing a little bit more on the stack, playing a little bit more at instant speed. Snapcaster Mage is not as much of a free roll in BGX decks as you might think, but especially if you have a good proactive card like Thought Scour to pair with them, that is something that you can do if you don't have anything better to do. It's a nice two for one that keeps you seeing cards, keeps filling up the graveyard. Um, Snapcaster Mage is like a two of. Yeah, feels really, really good in a deck like this, so we gotta at least touch on Sultai. Uh, another incentive to playing Sultai is that when you are on Snapcaster Mage and or when you are playing instant speed reactive cards like Thought Scour and like Permission, Veil of Summer gets that much better. And Veil of Summer, as we all know, is a completely grotesque, busted, disgusting, powerful card. And, you know, we should probably be using it to our advantage at least some of the time. Um, another cool incentive to play Sultai is Creeping Tar Pit. Creeping Tar Pit as an unblockable finisher. It just really brings home how outclassed Hissing Quagmire is because I've been like, Raging Ravine on Jund is awesome. 
Shambling Vent on Absent is awesome, and now Creeping Tar Pit on uh, Soul Tie on Bug is awesome. And, you know, Hissing Quagmire is, is kind of cool if you're able to block a big Eldrazi with it or something, but most of the time, you want your creature land to be a finisher, and these Three color decks have really good finishers as far as the man lands go. Um, yeah, so again, I won't go too deep into the weeds on Sultai because the video's already been very long and because that's not Nick's focus. But Sultai, again, it lets you play the broadest variety of styles uh, relative to any other BGX deck while staying in your color trio. You can play a little bit more tempo oriented, you can play a little bit more control oriented, or you can play a blue rock mid range deck just like this Earl Gari one. So, Sultai is pretty cool. Um, obviously, Permission has its limitations in Modern. That can be a bit of a bummer when you are playing Sultai. And it's also a bit of a bummer sometimes when you're signing up for the pain and the sometimes lack of consistency with your color production um, of a three-color deck, but you're not getting extra removal to compensate for it. So you can get a little bit more easily run over by go wide aggro decks, sometimes on Sultai than you can on Jund or Rock, certainly. Jund and Rock stand up really, really well to those. And Absent stands up well too. You know, sometimes you might have to suboptimally path something early, or sometimes your lingering souls will be chump blocking, but Absent still has a lot of really good tools, you know, that can stall the game or or can trade maybe not as ruthlessly, um, but can stabilize you to the late game where your card quality wins the day. On Sultai, sometimes you're just playing a three-color painful deck and you're drawing blue permission while you're getting run over by humans or goblins or something like that. So that's kind of the con of Sultai that I found, but this deck, man, Earl Gari felt really strong when I played it, and that would be probably my advice to you if you want to start off with Sultai. And money's no issue, you know, maybe Uro's a ban risk, I don't know. But, you know, in a perfect world you want to start out with Sultai, maybe start here. And if you're not sure exactly whether the mid-range style fully suits you, Sultai is actually a pretty cool color combination to buy into, because again, you can go more of a control route, you can go more of a tempo route, or you can stick with the mid-range route. Pretty cool stuff, if you ask me. All right, guys, so that was Sultai. Let's just tab over to Luris Jund here, the most recent Luris Jund list I played on the channel. Obviously, Luris, I don't think, is here to stay. I think either Companion will be errated, or Companion will outright be banned, or perhaps most likely they will just ban a select Companion or two or three or whatever. But if it's ban Companion... Um, ban any singular or multiple companions. Luris is clearly going to be the top of the list. So again, I want this video to stand the test of time. I want it to be a reference for people looking for a deep dive on what the various flavors of BGX mean. But right now, you've got a lot of incentives to play Luris Jund. You've just got like the ability to have Punishing Fire and Modern by looping this. You can play some really powerful two mana permanents, Kroxa, Run and Six, and you can play some really powerful top end spells that do not violate Luris's stipulation, and that includes the sideboard hate like Pillage and Boil. So I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds on this, but Luris Jund and Luris Rock, both very, very strong. Cat Rock, a very strong home for Luris. You know that Burn is everywhere. I mentioned this in the Rock section. When Burn is everywhere, Rock is a great deck to reach for. You have the Painless Mana. You line up naturally so, so well against Burn if you're respecting it even a little bit. So Luris is kind of a an anomaly, but in some ways Luris actually reinforces the broader points that existed before he came into being and will exist long after he has banned that um that really differentiate Rock from Jund, from Abzan, from Sultai. They all have their strengths, they all have their weaknesses, and I hope this was entertaining for you that, you know, whether you're a veteran BGX player, just Sometimes it's just nice to hear somebody talk about one of your favorite subjects, even if you already know most of what was said. Um, but if you're a newer player especially, I hope this was helpful because you have a little bit of a, a, a few guideposts, a few kind of um, things to weigh in your mind if you're considering buying into BGX but you don't know what to do. 
and you don't you want to go in with a long-term plan so a good short-term plan if you're pretty much committed is to start here to start with rock maybe not literally here because again i can't really advise people to buy into Luris and into mishra's bauble with it being an obvious ban risk so maybe we go back over to the stock rock list you know you, you if you think the ban is going to go through maybe you start here maybe you start here and from there you keep in mind what i said you keep in mind what i said about this specific rock deck and the pros and cons relative to Jund and to Absin and to Sultai. And over time, of course, it's really nice to own all of them. Obviously, especially in paper, that's a pretty big expense. So it's a decision that should not be made lightly, which is another reason why I hope this was helpful for you. So good times, my friends. And this video was already very, very long, and I did not even begin to cover everything that could possibly be covered. But that might be what the comment section is for. So let's make the comment section a resource unto itself a resource in its own right alongside the video as a supplement, as a companion. So you guys feel free to share your thoughts there, especially if you disagree with anything that I said here. But you experienced BGXers out there, you can share your pros and cons. Just tell me what you like, what you don't like. You know, maybe some of you flip between archetypes um, of BGX, the various flavors, depending on the meta. And maybe some of you are loyalists that play only one style come hell or high water. I'd love to hear about it. And I would like to say thank you for watching. Thank you to the Patreon supporters and especially thank you to Nick. Nick is of the veil. Nick requested this for the donation league that he qualified for. It became a donation theory video, and that is awesome. If you are enjoying this content, you can visit the description below where you can, number one, see the Patreon post I write explaining exactly how these donation leagues work. And number two, you can visit the Patreon page itself. That is the very best way to give back to this content if you are getting value out of it, if you are enjoying it, if it is making your life better in some way, shape, or form. You could make my life better by kicking me a few bucks per month. Uh, that gives you access to the Discord, and over time, you can earn donation leagues just like, the, just like the ones you've seen me play recently, and even just like this video. So thank you once again to everybody doing so. I hope everybody out there is staying safe and I will see you for the next video where I'm not sure what we're going to play but a little bit of a teaser for you if you made that made it this far um, we might be playing cat rock again for a donation league which I really like and I also have traded in some other cards to buy into this deck to buy into ad nauseum which is not very expensive online anyway at least relative to what a lot of modern decks cost but I did you know, I did cash in some extra cards I had lying around that I have no foreseeable use for. And I've got the itch to play a little bit of combo lately, I'm not going to lie. I know this is a BGX theory video and BGX will always be my first love, but even the Grim Flare does get a little bit tired of playing three-hour leagues every now and then and running into Veil of Summer all the time and blue snow piles and big mana and so on and so forth. It's just nice to have a combo deck in the back pocket, and I've always really liked Ad Nauseam, so maybe we play this sometime soon. I don't know. I gotta get unrusty with it. I used to own this in paper like three, four years ago before I narrowed my focus and started the channel and all that stuff, and obviously things have changed a lot, but maybe we'll play some Ad Nauseam soon. Who knows? But either way, my friends, I hope you stick around. I hope to see you for the next video, and I hope everybody out there has a wonderful night. Be well, and I will talk to you soon.